everybody. This is Anna Bryce from the uh, AMA Phoenix. I am the VP of Programming at the AMA Phoenix and welcome. We are really happy to have you join us. Uh, as I think everybody knows, we are having online events at least now and for the near future. Um, we hope to at some point get back to live in-person events, but right now it is all online. So thank you very much for joining us. I want to thank Taylor Wellman, who is our host from Financial Potion, uh, doing a great job hosting all of our webinar series events. So again, Taylor, thank you for stepping up as a sponsor. And as Taylor mentioned, please use the chat box. We are monitoring it. If you have any questions, we will be presenting the questions to our speaker, Chris, at the end of the, um, the webinar. One thing I would like to thank all of our sponsors, our AMA sponsors. They make all of these events and just us being able to be in existence possible. So again, really thank all of our sponsors. They've been with us for a while and have been supporting us for quite a while. And we would also like to thank our, our supporters, our supporting companies. Um, everybody on the AMA board works really hard and we have um, and we just thank everyone so much for the support that they bring to the table. And last, I just want to get right into it because Chris has a terrific presentation for us. And I would just like to jump right into it. So I would like to introduce Chris Sietzema. Perfect, by the way. That was excellent. Thank you. So yes, that's not I easy printed this out because it has the phonetic spelling for Chris's last name. And I have been psyching myself out all night thinking I'm not going to pronounce it properly. So I'm really happy Chris that I did. And we are so thrilled to welcome Chris back. We had Chris uh, present for us already a, a few years ago. It was November 2017, the last time we saw Chris. That was an in-person event, so we actually got to meet him and see him live and in person. But Chris, we are so thankful that you've agreed to join us today for the webinar. Chris comes to us with quite a lot of digital marketing experience, both in the agency world and in the corporate world. Then he left that world and started uh, Teach to Fish Digital which is a consultancy committed to helping its clients make sense of marketing data. And we all know how hard that is, uh, trying to make sense of all the data. So without further delay, I would like to present Chris. And Chris, again, thank you for joining us. We really look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Anna. That was an excellent intro. I appreciate it. Let me share my screen. First of all, thanks for being here, everybody. Um, this is the first time I've worn a collared shirt in probably two months. Had to pull this one out of storage, but I feel good about it. All right, um, a little bit of information about me real quick. Um, I provide analytics audits and configuration projects as well as reporting and insights. And, and Teach to Fish Digital actually started as a training service. Um, and many of my clients were nice enough to say, hey, Great training, thanks very much. Can you just do the work? And so it's, it's evolved over the years a little bit. Um, these are the clients that I'm happy to provide service for currently. Not taking any new clients on right at the moment, but if you all have any questions as a follow-up, my contact information will be the last slide in this deck. Um, speaking of the deck, um, this is an abridged version. Uh, when Nat Handler was, was kind enough to offer me the opportunity to speak to you all, that was like pre-COVID days when we were gonna be in person, we were gonna do um, a workshop actually. And so um, while the coronavirus has taken um, some time away from us in terms of our ability to get together, um, it hasn't limited the material that I'm going to share with you today. So I'm going to share an abridged version of, of the information, but um, you will receive a larger version um, that has all kinds of different resources and screenshots. So if you're a little uneasy about some things that you're doing in Google Analytics, um, that'll kind of walk you through it, okay? 
Um, the other thing that I'm going to share with you is a Google Sheet. Okay, so as I stated, this was originally going to be a, um, a webinar, or um, not a webinar, but a workshop. We're gonna do some things and get some things done. I still think we should. So within this sheet, let me share that with you guys right here. You will find, it's a Google Sheet, so you'll need a Google account to access it. But within this sheet, you will find your very own analytics audit checklist. Um, if you're a little unfamiliar about what all these things mean, there's a line here for descriptions. You'll see comments from yours truly for things to look for. As you start to build this out, you can just change the status to whatever you want. So it's, it's ready to go. Um, so if, if you want to conduct your own little audit on your own analytics account, go for it. Um, if you're an agency and you want to use this for service, go for it. Um, and there's some other items in here related to campaign tracking and event tracking, all kinds of nerdy stuff that we'll get into in just a moment, okay? Um, what else? I think that's it. Um, let's go. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say about this Google Sheet is that it's only viewable. So if you can edit it, then everybody's gonna see your edits. So what I did was I made it viewable, but you can make a copy of it, so you can make it your own, okay? So feel free to use that. All right, let's get into the, to the good stuff. Um, I have some good news and bad news about Google Analytics. The good news is that there are, there's just so many reports, guys. The bad news is that there are so many reports. So oftentimes when I'm working uh, with a group like yourselves, one question that often comes up is, hey, Chris, I'm somewhat familiar with Google Analytics. I've been in there before. I've logged in several times, but there's just a lot going on. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go section by section and for those who would consider themselves new to Google Analytics or in the novice category, we're going to make things very easy to understand. For those of you who are intermediate or advanced level, I'm going to sprinkle some, some nerdiness in there as we go, okay? So um, hopefully we'll make everybody happy. All right, so we're going to talk about audience reports, acquisition reports, and then behavior and conversions. After that, we're going to get into reporting, and then I'm going to talk about how to call insights or how to basically find some juicy notes in all this data, okay? Audience reports, there's many. The ones that I rely are marked with a red arrow right here, okay? And like I said, um, you'll have this deck and you'll have the recording, so if you don't want to take notes right now, it's a Thursday afternoon, don't bother. All right, so when I typically look at analytics, I think it's important to phrase this like Jeopardy style in the form of a question. What questions are we trying to answer with each one of these reports? Within the audience section of Google Analytics, we can get a kind of a good overview of what's going on. We can also find out where people are coming from, quite literally, like what geography, if they're new or returning visitors, what devices they use, if they are on mobile or desktop, all those good types of things, okay? Now you'll notice this, this is just the basic bland, Google Analytics home screen. We've all seen this before. The reason I call this out is that there are some metrics on this, on this dashboard right away that often get misunderstood and misconstrued. Let's talk about those now, okay? They are time on page, av average visit duration, and bounce rate, okay? Bounce rate's the easiest one to explain, so we're gonna knock that one out first. Here's what bounce rate is. Bounce rate is when a certain percentage of your audience visits a page and leaves the website from that page, okay? It's not somebody spent 10 seconds or somebody spent three minutes only or less than 15 seconds. It has nothing to do with time. It has everything to do with the number of pages seen. If people see one page and leave, they bounced, okay? This is important because let's say I want to hire a dog trainer. By the way, you might hear my dog bark during this presentation, hence the need for a dog trainer. If I go to a dog trainer's website and see that page and call a phone number, that sounds like a successful transaction for the dog trainer. However, I only saw one page. I'm a bounce, okay? So oftentimes we think of bounce rate as a negative, but it's not negative if we can get the job done in one single page visit, okay? The other two that are often misconstrued are time on page and average site duration or visit duration, okay? And these, these have everything to do with time. Okay, and the reason these are often a little bit tricky is because here's how Google Analytics tracks time. It doesn't know when you started until you move on to a second page, okay? So if I'm on that one page for the dog trainer for 10 minutes and leave, my, my time on site is zero or null, 
because Google has no idea. Yeah. If I go to another page after eight minutes, well, my time on page has been about eight minutes, right? So, so that's basically why this is very difficult to understand and why I don't really trust average visit duration or time on site metrics so much from Google Analytics because they're not really telling the whole story. What they do is average visit duration, this is the full time on the website, they take the total yeah. time and divide it by the number of sessions. Well, half, if half the people see one page, those are all zero, which totally screws up your data. Time on page is a little bit better because what they do is they take page views and subtract anybody who exited from a singular page and then they, they you know, use that as the denominator over time or under time, okay? So that can actually be inflated. So this is just a warning to be very careful when we're making really important business decisions based upon these metrics, okay? There you go. Let's move into the acquisition reports here. Um, now these are basically answering questions related to where people came from, not from a geographics perspective, but like channels and sources and campaigns. Um, there's some information about Google Ads and Search Console, which is a handy SEO tool from Google, and also uh, campaigns, okay? Now, this is a really important piece of this that often takes a little bit of time and understanding to make sure that we're tracking right from the start, okay? Correctly from the start. Here's what I mean by that. Within Google Analytics, if someone comes from Google SEO, Google automatically knows that they came from Google SEO, okay? If they came from a Facebook ad, they don't necessarily know it's an ad. So you have to tell Google where exactly they came from, what the ad was for, what the message of the ad was, whether it was an, a promoted post or some kind of uh, audience building message or a Facebook lead ad, whatever it is. So with source, medium, and campaign, these are values that we can add information to uh, to make sure that our, our campaigns are tracked appropriately. Right? So if you have an email campaign, a social media campaign, paid search, uh, if you have a display advertising campaign, you're going to want to create source, medium, and campaign values for all your campaigns. How do you do that? Okay, so there's a tool. All right? If you go to Google and search for campaign URL builder, you will find it. All right? It's a very handy little tool, and I'm going to show it to you right now. All right, here we go. So let's go here. And let's say we want to track this, uh, this page all about this webinar. Hey, handsome. So we're going we're gonna to make sure that we, we want to promote this page and see how many people actually access this page from a Facebook campaign, let's say, okay? So here I am on the campaign URL builder. I popped in my website URL right here. The campaign source, because I'm going to promote it on Facebook, is Facebook. It's an ad. So the medium is gonna be CPC, but really the world is your oyster with what you call these. You just have to make sure that you remember what you called them. And that's gonna come into play later. And then the campaign name, let's say I wanna talk about the analytics webinar. Down below, this little tool right here is actually concatenating, which is a fun word to say, concatenating all of these values together into URL that you can then give to Facebook and say, hey, here's all the stuff for my URL, right? And if I change this to say, hey, this ad actually says register, you can see down below that it's changing in real time, okay? Now, the problem, the, the beautiful thing about this is it gives you exactly what you need to track all of your activity from every campaign you've got. The problem with it is that you can only do one at a time. Until now, let's check this out. So there's a, a UTM tracking sheet, and this is all ready to go for you, okay? So let's, again, we're gonna grab our, our URL that we're gonna drive traffic to. We're going to paste that in this column right here for landing page, okay? And then we're going to say the source is Facebook, the medium is CPC, and it's the analytics, blah, 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 right? So while that was happening, this column right here appended everything for you, okay? And so there's a handy little formula right in here that you can use, and you can create as many of these as you want. If you need more, great just copy the formula down and you're good to go okay so many of you might already have something like this in play um, and it's it's an easy way to create uh, tracking code appended urls really quickly in a very easy to use format that can be shared amongst multiple team members so i've got some folks that work with other agencies and they're having their agencies create utm or tracking codes in this tool okay here's the problem with this one after about six months or so, or maybe six days, it can get a little unwieldy if you've got a lot of campaign activity going on. 
So for that reason, you'll find right in here some other tools to consider. These are tools that allow you to, um, they're basically software that allow you to do all of that stuff from a, from a software app. So you just log on to terminusapp.com or utm.io, which is actually like a Chrome extension. And so these tools allow you to track everything, but also have a historical record for everything that you create from a campaign tracking perspective. So two months from now, if you see something in Google Analytics where a lot of traffic is coming from a specific, specific campaign, and you're not sure what campaign that is, you can just look, look in here. It's got everything recorded for you, okay? So let's move on to the behavior reports. Um, within their behavior reports, we're basically answering the question, what are people doing? Where are they going? What pages did they land on? Do they use site search? So site search is basically if you've got a little search bar in your website, so people can search content from within your website, and events. Most of these are pretty self-explanatory. Our pages, landing pages, site search. Events is one that I want to kind of focus in on for this, for this time. Um, events are basically on-click behaviors. And so this is basically a quick report from one of my clients in which they're tracking all kinds of different things from, with events. And events are not default. They're not built into Google Analytics. You've got to create them, okay? So this particular report has scroll events, video tracking, so they can track how many times a video is watched and what videos are watched and for how long on their website. The PDFs that were downloaded, uh, credential, like contacts, all kinds of different things. Look like there's some 404 and wow, there's a lot of them. That's the problem they need to fix, right? So all of this can be created two ways. One way is you can create an event by actually slapping code into the website and making sure that certain things can be tracked, which is no fun at all especially if you've got a, a website or an app with a lot of pages or screens on it, okay? Mm -hmm. The other way to go about it is with a little tool called Google Tag Manager, okay? So Google Tag Manager is, is essential for any analyst, I think any, any marketing person. If you don't use it yet, you should probably consider doing it. Here's, here's how it works. You have uh, tools like analytics or Google Ads or Facebook ads that all require little pieces of tracking code or script to be placed on your website to allow all these tools to work. The mm -hmm. old school way of doing it is actually placing all that script within the website, okay? What Google Tag Manager does is it provides kind of like a, a separate tag, almost that works like a bucket or a container into which all of these other tags can be placed. So it's much more efficient from a, a tracking standpoint, but also a code management standpoint. So because it takes your code from what looks like this down to this for all of your tags, okay? The other reason I would recommend using it is because Google, Google Tag Manager allows you to easily create events that you can track, okay? So here's an example um, of just a, a quick schema, which is just a fancy word for a spreadsheet, spreadsheet, okay? So here we've got There we go, I think I'm back. These are the values that you will see in, in, in uh, Google Analytics when you track events, okay? So um, this is difficult because it takes a little bit of time to figure out what do I wanna track and how, how exactly do I get it tracked and things like that. There's more information within this larger deck, this is the abridged version again, that you can check out and use. If you have questions, there's tons of resources. You can always just give me a call or shoot me an email, whatever. I'm happy to make more sense of it. In the meantime, um, this sheet that we put together for you also has a little tracking schema. This is for the more advanced and, and folks in the room. But these are sample events that can be added to Google Tag Manager to track things like phone calls and email address clicks and PDF downloads and scroll behavior and 404 error pages and all that good stuff. These are pretty universal. When I'm doing um, this type of work for a client, this list is probably like 20 to 50 events long right? Because there's a lot, of different, a lot of different behaviors that we might want to monitor. So the rule of thumb is with anything with, with analytics configuration, if you do not write it down, it doesn't exist. So whether you use Google Sheets or Excel or whatever, write it down so that you can remember what you did. And those on your team can also understand what's going on in terms of just the tracking configuration, okay? So documentation is a huge deal um, that you should definitely rely upon, all right? Let's talk about the fourth and final area of Google Analytics, um, which is the conversions. These are basically goals that we're tracking, right? And so the reports that I typically use are like reverse goal path, e-commerce for anybody who's, who's managing a store or tracking e-commerce activity, 
and multi-channel funnels, which is a lot of fun. We're going to come back to the goal conversion setup in a bit, but let's talk about this multi-channel funnels. What is that about? So what that is, is it is allows you to track multiple steps in a buyer's journey. I don't know what the metrics are now. I think it's somewhere between, and it probably varies per, per organization, but your average customer will probably take somewhere between five and 105 touch points to become a customer, like on average, right? So it takes maybe a visit to the site, maybe a call, maybe they see an advertisement, maybe they click on the advertisement, maybe they sign up for email, maybe they download a PDF, et cetera. There's a lot of different touch points that, that come into play with not only website content, but just content marketing in general. What assisted conversions allow you to do is understand what are the common paths people take so you can get a good handle on um, which channels are more top of the funnel and which channels work really well at the bottom of the funnel when people are ready to convert, okay? And this, the, the word for this is attribution. And it's just a process for quantifying contribution. How much did this channel participate and contribute versus another channel, okay? So that's what these reports allow us to do. They're not perfect in Google Analytics, um, but they're, they're pretty helpful. Okay, the easiest way to explain attribution is to talk about baseball. Do you guys remember baseball? So um, the last official game that was played was played in Houston. And uh, Houston Astros have had a few challenges since this time. Uh, so has the country for, for that matter. But the, the winning, the last team to win a baseball game in this, in this country was um, the Washington Nationals. And these are the three characters that were the pitchers for the Washington Nationals. There's Max, there's Patrick and there's Daniel, all right? Max, Max pitched five innings, Patrick pitched three, and Daniel pitched the final ninth inning, okay? They won the game. And by the way, these guys are all former Diamondbacks, which makes me shed one little tear down my cheek. Um, but these, these guys were the ones who pitched the final game. My question for you is they won the World Series. Who gets credit? Does Max get credit? Does Patrick get credit? Do they all get credit? How does this work? And this question, understanding this question is very similar to understanding which of your channels get credit. Like there's some gonna be like Max who pitches the start of the game, Patrick's right in the middle, and then Daniel comes in at the end. It's just like the funnel, right? Um, so we talked about a baseball game. Let's talk about a typical marketing game. Nine innings, right? First inning, they hear a radio ad. They do a Google search. They see a display retargeting message. They download some content. By doing that, they get an email confirmation. They get another email with an offer. They click on that offer. They put a piece of uh, content or, or, or product in their shopping cart. They, they abandon that shopping cart and they see another display ad, which they click. And finally, later on, they click a paid search ad and buy the product or sign up for the lead form or whatever it is. My question to you is who gets the credit? This is hard, right? So this is why attribution in those reports can really be super helpful. That now there's different attribution models as well. In this scenario, the one channel that would get all the credit is Google search right down here, Google paid search. The reason for that is as a default, Google Analytics relies upon what's called last click attribution, okay? So Daniel Hudson pitching the ninth inning gets the MVP trophy, despite the fact that he pitched nine strikes the whole game, right? So um, he played an important role, but it's a lot of credit for just one, one inning and 12 pitches, okay? So the reason I have problems with this one is that marketing is like gumbo. Like there's a lot of different ingredients that go into it to make magic, okay? Um, in, this, in this instance with last click attribution, in this bowl right here, if someone said, wow, that's good gumbo, I really like the rice. Like that's the last thing that was added to this bowl, right? That doesn't make sense at all. So last click attribution has its problems. First click attribution is just the opposite, where the first one who, to make the touch point, in our case, the radio ad way at the start gets all the credit. This one's tough as well, because number one, it's difficult to prove. How do we know that they heard that radio ad? Um, and it kind of assumes that, I guess all remarketing efforts are not that important. And the other thing is that sales cycles, especially for something like a home or any big ticket item can be really long. Um, so the, the media agency could be hired and fired in the time it takes somebody to make a decision to, to purchase a product, right? The other one is linear. Um, linear basically is everybody gets a trophy. Everybody's equal. And I don't really love this one either because look at poor Max. He, he pitched 103 pitches. That's pitch count. PC is pitch count. 
And again, Daniel gets equal credit for just pitching 12 pitches. That's not right. Another one is called time decay. Um, and this one basically gives incremental credit to those channels that are toward the end of the sales funnel, okay? Which um, has its issues, right? Um, here's one, like for instance, we've all seen award shows in which um, somebody gets up and accepts their award and gives a very emotional speech. Who do they thank? They thank the producer, the director, the cinematographer, their agent or, a or team of agents, their stylist, their personal trainer, who, whatever. They very rarely, now Mr. McConaughey did this, but very rarely do they remember mom or do they remember their little league coach or their first acting teacher, right? So it doesn't give fair credit to those people who had a really big impact early on in the buying cycle. The one that I kind of like the most but has its own issues is this position-based one where we as the analysts, we as the marketers get to decide which steps get the most credit. Okay, so this one is called U shape because it kind of looks like a U. You can see that. Other way, other ones are like there's a W shaped one where some important action in the middle happens. So, for example, channel pr provides awareness, another channel gets an email subscription, and the person finally converts through some other channel. Like there's got to be some important events that we monitor throughout. They're probably more important than others. The trick to all this, and I'm sorry to tell you, tell you this, is that. Every marketing mix is unique, every brand is unique, and every marketing campaign is unique. And thus, you probably need your own unique channel, or, or I'm sorry, attribution model, okay? Sorry, um, but you can do it. Uh, and, and there's a ways to kind of compare different models within, within Google Analytics to understand like, which model should we use? Because I'll tell you from, a, from someone who talks a lot to people who run social, mark, social media campaigns or display advertising campaigns who probably don't get their credit that's due, because those channels don't often convert as well as like direct or organic search. This is really important to prove your worth, okay? Now, within the deck, this is where it gets a very um, expansive in terms of setup and configuration. I'm not including this, this here because we've got some limited time, but within the, the, the um, expanded deck, you're gonna find information about how to configure things within the admin section of Google Analytics that hopefully will be uh, helpful to you. Okay, so check that out. Um, as we stated, there's conversions. There's actually four types of, types of conversion goals in Google Analytics. One is how long did somebody spend on the site because the time on site metric is flawed. We know that one's no good. Um, another one is how many, market is a goal if someone sees like eight pages or five pages on the website, which to me doesn't really help because if you see, let's say 10 pages, that means the person is really engaged or really lost, right? So the two that we rely upon most are destination-oriented oriented conversions, when, which someone accesses a thank you page, or event-oriented conversions, in which someone clicks here, like download this PDF, or fill out this form that doesn't go to a thank you page, um, or sign up for email, or click that phone number, or whatever it is, right? So it's all on-click events, right? So one other challenge with goals that I think I should provide a warning about is that um, there are 20 goals like 20 slots for goals in Google Analytics. You can, you can create up to 20 goal conversions in Google Analytics. If you do, that sounds crazy to me. Like if we measure, um, if everything is important, then nothing is important. So an exercise that I would highly recommend that you go through is really kind of determine which of these behaviors that are of somewhat importance are most important because they are most indicative of business success. They show that we are actually accomplishing our, our business goals. Let me give you an example. I work with a number of universities. Here's an example from Southern Methodist University. They have a few different goals such as undergrad apply, graduate accounts. They wanna measure every time somebody schedules a visit to their beautiful campus in Dallas. And then they also wanna measure Instagram follows. Okay, so here's how this works. This undergrad apply will be happening when someone completes an application, easy enough. And, and there's a thank you page for that application. So that's gonna be a destination goal type. The graduate account, in order to be a graduate student at SMU, you've gotta create an account. And when someone creates an account, there's also a thank you page, like thank you for creating your account, you're good to go. We wanna track how many times people get there because that's, that's a good indicator of success. And lastly, there's a schedule visit form where you can actually plan a visit to SMU. That form doesn't show a thank you page, it just says, thanks, and that's it. it. Just has like a little message that pops under the form. 
So we're going to track that as an event. Every time somebody submits that form, that's an event. Okay. Now the last one they want to follow is Instagram followers, clicks to follow SMU on Instagram. No, that is not a goal. That is not a business conversion. While Instagram might play an important role in business success, the fact that someone follows you on Instagram is not a real good indicator in my opinion. Now for your specific instance, you, you could make a case that some kind of social media follow activity is super important and thus it should be marked as a goal. I think that's a tough argument to make though, okay? All right, that is the kind of configuration portion of uh, Google Analytics. We've got around 10, 20 minutes before we jump into questions. The next piece of this, we're gonna talk about reporting, okay? We're also gonna talk, if we've got time, about how to read tea leaves, how to basically look at data and know what, what to do with it next. Like make recommendations and, and suggest next steps. Make that data actionable, okay? Now, some of you who know me have probably seen this one before. It's an oldie bit of goodie, but it's important. So uh, a while back, a buddy of mine came to me and said, hey, Chris, I have a client that's doing some reporting I'd love to send it your way. Can you take a look? I said, sure. Here's what it looked like. Pretty standard. Some notes, some charts, some graphs. Not the most pretty report in the world, but that's okay. They're doing things. Now, as you scroll, it gets a little more complicated. And as you scroll, I want you to imagine the meeting you would have to sit through, virtual or in person, to go through all this. This is not the way to do it. So if you do, are doing this now, please stop, okay? More is not more, okay? Um, simple is better, so we can make some decisions on it. So as a rule, as I'm helping clients create reports or I'm creating reports on their behalf, I try to adhere to a rule that I can almost in every case adhere to it. That is one page. You get one page because this is not our report as an analyst, it's the audience's reports and they have to read it. And they have to read, if they have to read through this, God help them. If they have to read through this, not so bad. Now you'll note that there's some notes. That's the most important part because we are translating the data that lives up here, okay? I've got one client that likes to actually broadcast her reports on screen. And so that has a different orientation right here. You don't see any notes here because she actually narrates the report for those that she's presenting it to. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, okay? And the reason we wanna keep things very simple is so that our audiences understand them. Um, this is very difficult to understand over here. Where, where do I go first? What's most important? Okay, reports are like icebergs. If you, if you look at this big block of ice, this big chunk of ice, this represents all the data that we have available to us. You'll notice that only above the surface, there's just a little bit of information, a little bit of data. And that is the data we must present. That is the data we must show, okay? That's the most important stuff that our audience will gravitate to, they'll understand, okay? Now, as an analyst, that doesn't mean that all this stuff below the surface isn't important. Actually, that's where the good stuff lies. Sometimes, based upon what we're showing here with the charts and graphs and tables, we see little indicators that say, hmm, something else is going on here. I'm going to dive below the surface and check that out and then call this out in notes, okay? So as an analyst, we must know everything. We must have a good understanding and appreciation for the entire ice block, but we only want to show our audiences the most important stuff so that we can, in turn, make some decisions. I'm not gonna go through this in, in total detail, but this is basically a nice little checklist to create a dashboard. You'll note that there are pieces within this that include just basic review of your primary goals, like what are we trying to show? What, what's the story we wanna tell? I always create a sketch. I might have some around here, like I've got sketches everywhere for reports that I create. Um, configure your data sources and, and then create and edit the layout. So with all of these, all of these are pretty much done in, in, in Data Studio. Um, Data Studio is a tool that I'll talk about in a second. But the one thing I wanted to stress here is like, oh, oh we've got a two page report, that's not bad, here's why. Your, your report layout and configuration should reflect your audience. Executive folks, those sitting around the boardroom table, they don't have time. Just tell them what they need to know. Get in, get out, be bright, um, be brief and be gone, okay? So should you provide recommendations? Absolutely, but they, they don't have time, okay? At the management level where, where this, this person's probably getting their hands dirty, managing campaigns or managing others who, who do the heavy lifting with the campaigns, you can probably get a little bit more detailed. And if you're talking to another nerd, feel free to nerd out, right? So you can get a little bit more detailed here with, with a two-page report if that's necessary, okay? 
As I stated earlier, here's a sample report. The most important part is right there. Um, with some of the tools that are available to us today, this part can be automated. It is automated, okay? Um, we don't need to spend a lot of time on that. Where we spend a lot of time is right in here, translating this data, highlighting trends, making recommendations and suggesting next steps. One common issue that I, that I see a lot among analysts is the idea and the belief that their job is to report the news and that's all. And that's not what I believe <laughs> at all. Um, I believe the analyst position is to have a stand, have an opinion, suggest something, make a recommendation. It's okay, right? Some of you are, who are watching this are probably saying, yeah, that's not a problem for me and good for you. Like, don't change. Um, but some of us who are more analytical and maybe reserved in nature, have an opinion. Like, tell us what we need to know and tell us what to do. It's important. You're closest to the data. All right. Um, for automated reporting, um, like I said, I use Google Data Studio quite a bit. I used to do reports manually. It was kind of like, I also used to like use film cameras a, a while ago. Um, but all of these tools are so much better and Google Data Studio is getting better all the time. And I highly recommend if you haven't messed around with it yet, you absolutely should. If you're not familiar with Google Data Studio, it's basically a dashboarding tool where you can pull data from different parts of your analytics programs and your ads programs to make one happy dashboard that tells a compelling story from which you can make decisions. Um, Tableau is another popular one. I really like that one. And then Power BI is really cool. Um, the only issue with Power BI is I'm a Mac person and I can't use it on my Mac. I've got to go to my wife who um, has a PC and, and, and use her. We, we call the PC Melinda. So every time I have to use Power BI, I say, hey, can I use Melinda? So um, I, um, I like Power BI, it's just limited to, to uh, PCs, okay? Um, again, not gonna go through all the detail here because we're limited on time, but there are some pros and cons to automated versus manual. To basically summarize this, the pros of, of the automated is it just saves time. The cons are a lot of times when we create these reports, we're like, done. It, the, the report created itself, don't have to do anything, and that's a fallacy. Like we've gotta still dig in and spend time on it and get our hands dirty trying to understand what's actually happening and what we're gonna do about it. The manual reports force us to do that type of digging, and there's no limits on formatting. The, the cons obviously is it just takes more time to, to create those manual reports in Excel or Mac numbers or whatever you, whatever you create those reports in, okay? So within, within Data Studio, there's a little bit more information in the, in the full deck in this abridged version, I've got a couple of notes for you here. Uh, this is just a quick screenshot of data student. In there, you can see reports and data sources. Let's focus on data sources just for a moment. Here are some of the data sources that are available, and you're gonna find a trend, okay? Google Analytics, Google Ads, Google Search Console, Google Sheets, Google BigQuery. Google Data Studio is very good at integrating tools that start with the word Google, okay? However, you might be utilizing some other resources that don't start with the word Google, such as Facebook or MailChimp. YouTube's in there, we're good on YouTube. Bing, uh, Marketo, like all of these tools might be a part of your program and they, thus they need to be represented within your data set, within your report, so you can tell their story as well. So what you need to do to, to make sure this is a reality is find what's called a data connector, okay? Uh, a, a way to explain this is that these tools funnel supermetrics, report dash, integromat, et cetera. These are like translators. They translate data from Bing ads or MailChimp or Constant Contact or what, wherever you use, uh, your, where, wherever you do marketing. And they pull it into the Google Data Studio in a nice way. I've used them all. I don't necessarily have a recommendation for you. Try the one that works. Try the one that actually works for the tools that you're utilizing. Um, sometimes they're free if you only have a couple connections. Sometimes they there's a fee involved, like a monthly fee, but check those out, okay? Um, Integromat is one that I've checked out a lot. Look at all the data connections that are available via, via Integromat. This is ridiculous, okay? So chances are you can probably find, again, not an endorsement, but you can probably find a connection with Integromat to get your data out of whatever tool you're working with and into Google Data Studio or in Tableau or wherever you, you're presenting and reporting your data, okay? There's definitely a cyclical process to reporting. That is pull data, make sure that data looks right. You might have to do little configurations and some modifications to make sure it's pulling through okay. And then you get busy doing uh, some work with pulling those insights 
And then finally, I always save a report in Data Studio. If you guys are using Data Studio now, download your weekly or monthly reports as PDFs. That way you have a historical record of all of your um, metrics, but also all of your amazing insights, okay? All right, we have a little over 15 minutes left, all right? At this point, uh, Taylor, I'm gonna pause and see if there's any questions I can answer about what we've covered so far. And with the remaining time, I'm gonna talk about uh, this analytics insights portion um, in which we're gonna just basically cover three methods that I utilize when translating data and looking for really important uh, insights um, and takeaways and action items from, from reports, okay? So any, any questions at this point? Well, this question that came up uh, might go well with what you're gonna be diving into is that, you know, since we cannot really get 100% accurate data on, you know, an average visit duration, for example, you know, what is the suggestion in getting as close as possible in determining the accurate data? Okay. Number one, whoever asked that, good, good on you. Great question. Um, there's a, there's a couple things. Number one, time on page actually works pretty well when your exit rate is low. Uh, average visit duration is a little tricky. I, I worry about that. I would, I would focus also on pages per visit. That might tell you ex a little bit more about how people are moving through the website, not, not necessarily how much time they're spending. The other thing is. Within Google Tag Manager, you can create what are called timer triggers. I hope you guys can see this okay. A timer trigger is basically an event that fires at certain increments and intervals that you dictate. So for example, I can fire a timer trigger that says, hey, this person just spent 60 seconds on the website or 120 seconds on the website. And I can create as many of these as possible. So for example, if there's a very specific landing page you want to monitor that does have a decent exit rate, people leave from quite a bit you can fire these events to tell on average like how many people sp spend three minutes because this is accurate like this is indisputably accurate because you're you're in control of that data i hope that makes sense so we have another okay. question that says um do you see having analytics to have an opinion versus being able to tell a story to be different can you repeat that one more time i want to understand that yes yes it says do you see having analytics to have an opinion versus being able to tell a story to be different? Yes. So when I say have an opinion, um, what I basically mean is you're telling the story of what happened and your opinion is here's what we should do next. Based upon a result, let's say traffic is up and some other metrics are happening, sales are down, what should we do? Like, what's your, what are, what is your suggestion? Suggestion. What's your opinion on what the next step should be? Um, so they go hand in hand. I hope I'm answering this question appropriately based upon the context of it that was posed by the person who asked it. But I think you tell the story about what happened. That's indisputable because the data is right there. The opinion and the suggestion, the recommendation, and the action item comes after. What I'm saying is always have an opinion. Always. And that opinion might be closer to fact than actual like, I think we should, you know. It, so you might be able to make an educated guess as, as the next best step, but I think those go hand in hand. Excellent, thank you. Um, looks like there are no other questions at this time, so feel free to move forward in Analytics Insights. And if anyone else comes up with a question you wanna ask, please post them in the chat. We will try to have Chris answer them while we're all together. However, if we do run out of time, any questions that you uh, put in the chat, we will send to Chris, and then that way uh, he can then respond after this event if we don't get to it. All right. So there's a, a number of different like methods that I use to call insights and kind of find um, the really um, juicy takeaways in those suggested opinions or action items from a report and from a data set. Um, the three that I'm going to cover with you now are, are basically called pointillism, the empathy method, and then findings along the funnel. I use them all pretty much every month, every time I do uh, reporting for clients, okay? So pointillism is based upon this wonderful painting from a, a fellow named George Seurat. And if you've ever been to the Art Institute of Chicago, you've probably seen this. It is gigantic. It's probably like eight feet tall and 15 feet wide. 
But if you look really closely at this painting, you'll see a number of dots. Seurat, uh, kind of like Van Gogh did, but a little bit more in intricately, uh, he used what's called the pointillism method. So a, a collection of dots create this beautiful picture. And this picture is, uh, I believe it's the Sunday afternoon on the island of Le Grand Jatte, I believe that is what it's called. Um, and so every single dot adds to the picture and the story that's being told, okay? Um, and there's a lot of dots, right? In a very similar way, the analyst needs to find a number of dots to tell a compelling story. Hopefully this segues nicely into the question that was just asked. Okay, so it's not okay to just have one dot and expect that to provide a beautiful, ornate picture on your measurement canvas, okay? Let me, let me talk about this a little bit further, okay? Typically, from month to month or period to period, or week to week, whatever it is we're looking at, we are looking at historical versus present data, okay? In the current period, A, B, and C, and D had this bar graph versus, or this column graph worth, worth of data. Previously, they had this, okay? So A could be, convert, all these letters could stand for pages, they could be traffic from a source, they could be conversion types. When I look at this, you can see that something happened here. Here's what an insight should not sound like. C went up, period, right? Like that's, that's not good enough. So we've got to understand, all right, a little bit more. Like what, what about C? Why did C go up? What happened? Who did it happen among? Was there a channel that had, um, had an impact on it, okay? By saying C went up, that's not even the equivalent of creating the dots necessary to make this random monkey in the middle of this, of this picture, okay? What we have to do is answer more questions to tell that story, to give more data, and we've got to dig. This is why the insights part takes time, and this is why this is where the analyst gets paid. As I stated earlier, we can automate the reports. The, analysts earned, the analyst earns her keep by doing this type of thing, okay? Let me give you a real life example. I work for a company called Vermeer. They are in beautiful Pella, Iowa. Um, they sell agriculture equipment. And if you've ever seen those, uh, those machines on the side of the road where you like load trees or branches into this, into this machine that like turns them into wood chips, they, they make those things. And I see them all the time. They're like the leader in that, in, that, uh, in that industry, whatever that industry is, brush chipping. Okay, so what they did is they were promoting this uh, new equipment they've got for forage innovations. And you'll note that things really started to happen toward the later part of February. They earned about 6,500 views and 22 hours of watch time. Basically, they turned YouTube ads on, okay? And what I wanna find is they spent a pretty penny on YouTube ads. Was it worth it? Did it actually pan out, okay? So let's find out. There's, so we've got one dot, two dots right now so far. Not a lot, right? If we dig further, this data is from Google Analytics. The blue line shows us page traffic from all sources to this Forage Innovations page, okay? Which was basically covered in, in the video that I just mentioned. The green line shows traffic from YouTube, which is minimal. Like we saw a whole lot of views, but nobody came from YouTube to the website. That's interesting. Okay, there's some more dots for us. And then the orange line shows traffic from organic search. So what we had assumed was people were gonna come right from YouTube to Vermeer, to their website, to look at this page. That didn't happen. What happened was people saw the video, they went to Google, and then they went to the website, okay? And after they turned that off, the traffic kind of subsided a little bit, okay? So there was basically an indirect impact from YouTube to Google to, to the website. During this time in which the video was live, traffic went up 63% and conversions went up 72%. So the, the question is, did YouTube work? Yep. Now, a lot of dots here, right? And this probably took about, you know, 30 minutes to 45 minutes to uncover all of this data and explain it and talk about what happened. This takes time, which is why I'll have another rule for every hour spent gathering data, spend three performing analysis. It just takes time, okay? Set aside the hours necessary to find the, the most important and juicy stuff possible, all right? All right, next one. Uh, this is the empathy method, all right? You might recognize this handsome fella as Abraham Lincoln as played by, um, I'm totally blanking on his name right now. Who can help me? Daniel Day-Lewis. Yes. Thank you. I had like a total 
must be the COVID. So Daniel Day-Lewis employs the method acting principle, okay? So I talked to a lady, this is a true story. I talked to a lady who lived in Richmond, Virginia at the time that they filmed this movie while uh, uh, she, she lived there. And while he was there, he would sign his checks at restaurants as commander in chief. This is Daniel Day-Lewis I'm talking about. Like he, he lives in the mode of whatever the, the character is he's playing and he doesn't break character the entire time he stays in it, okay? That's method acting, okay? So he lives and embodies the person he's playing. The person we need to embody and think about is not our reporting audiences, but the end user, whoever is using our websites or our, our campaigns or whatever. We need to have empathy for that person as an analyst. We need to see with their eyes and live, listen with their ears and feel with their heart, okay? Here's an example. Did a little bit of work last year with Arizona uh, Highways Photoscapes. They basically sell these amazing photography workshops where people can go to all these different places, not only in Arizona, but around the world, okay? And they were promoting these pages with a number of different channels, including Google Ads, Facebook ads, and then some print ads with different uh, photography type industry, industry sites and publications. Here's what they were getting. They're getting a lot of new people, but people would bounce at a high rate and it wasn't a great return on ad spend. So they weren't seeing a lot of people who were actually uh, taking the next step to purchase a workshop, which by the way is totally worth it. So what we did is we employed the empathy method. All right. So their customer looks like that lady right there. Okay, so this is, it was an interesting exercise because I had to think about what she would be thinking when she went to this website. And what we found was that um, because there was such a high volume of new visitors to the website and because um, this person may not feel comfortable forking over $2,700 right away for a photography workshop, it takes a little time. So as opposed to saying, hey, sign up now, we introduced just a, another way for people to learn more about where they can take beautiful photographs within the state of Arizona and just gather their email address. That's it. You'll note that this form does not include name or zip code or whether they're left-handed or right-handed or what kind of camera they use or what their favorite character on the, work, on the show Golden Girls was. Mine was Blanche, by the way. Like it, just, just get the email. That's it. Okay, that's it. Now we have the email and we can send them a little bit more information about what the workshops are like, how it's comfortable, how it's safe, what you'll learn, why it's totally worth it, where we're gonna go this year. And that actually helped them pick up sales. So by kind of seeing this experience through this nice lady's eyes, uh, we were able to um, pick up sales and, and activity for them, which is, which is important. The other thing that we did, which is kind of important is we included a phone number. So uh, typically their, their audience is retirees and from someone who talks to, uh, whose mother calls him like once a week, it's like th these people wanna talk, right? So that was an important distinction. Um, last one that I'll, I'll walk through quickly is um, this findings along the funnel, okay? And I know we've got limited time. So um, I think we can all agree that there's three major things we're trying to do regardless of our industry, regardless of our organization or our business, that those are. We want to increase volume, we want more. More sales, more traffic, more eyeballs, all that stuff. We want to improve yield, which is we want to get more with less, better ROI, and we want to eliminate waste. If it doesn't work, let's stop doing it, okay? At the same time, I think we're all familiar with the funnel, like top, middle, bottom, awareness, interest, action. You've all seen this before as marketing folks, okay? Now, what if we were to combine those two elements into something wonderful and magical? All right, so we're gonna take a look at different ways to increase volume at each stage of the funnel, different ways to improve yield at each stage of the funnel and so on. Now, we could spend 45 minutes to an hour just on this alone. You're gonna have a copy of this, so I'm not gonna go through it. But what this is, it's is a different way to look at um, how to improve results. Okay, so for example, if our main goal is to increase volume, how do we do that at the awareness stage? Well, we might wanna find topics in demand, like different keywords that people are looking for. If our challenge is to improve yield, how do we do that at the interest level? Well, we might wanna make sure that our assets are really potent and that they're amazing and people wanna download them and interact with them and engage with them and, and provide their contact information in exchange for them and all that kind of a thing. And if our goal is to eliminate waste, how do we do that at the action level? Well, if there's a people are abandoning that shopping cart, let's figure out where they're abandoning it. So every one of these little Hollywood square blocks here includes a type of way to think about how to improve results 
um, and aligns with awareness, interest, and action to kind of coincide with increasing volume, improving yield, and eliminating waste. I hope that makes sense. I know we're running low on time, but um, one, one note I'll, I'll leave you with here is that every semester, one of my friends who um, uh, is nice enough to invite me to speak to students at Arizona State University in his digital marketing class, we talk about this, and they're, they're actually kind of taking a little bit this, of this and actually going to incorporate it into their curriculum, which I'm super proud and excited about. Um, but this gives some examples of how that works. There's a little bit of information about how we're looking at these and what we're trying to do there. Ultimately, from, it, from an analytics perspective, we're after accuracy, accountability, and vision. We want to tell true stories, but we also want to make some things happen um, and kind of forecast what's going to happen in the future. Among all, if we do analytics the right way, it brings about these three elements, but it also brings the most important element, which is trust. Okay? And no matter what you're looking at, whether it's a simple Facebook insights report or an SEO uh, report, or if it's something ornate like um, a data studio report, the objective is to find the sacred in the ordinary. And I, and I think the word sacred is important because when we talk about how analytics has an impact on us, it molds our beliefs for how we uh, approach our businesses and our organizations and, and the tenets that we live by and that we advertise and that we conduct marketing activities by so that we can build about greater results um, for our brands and, and for the people that we care about. That is it. There's my contact information. Any other last minute questions? I know we're up on the, up on the time there. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, it does look like we do have one additional question and Anna, I don't know if I quite understand the question, so okay. would you mind saying it? Sure. So Chris, in that first example that you gave with the, um, the wood chipper company, yeah. um, you said that they went to YouTube, then to Google, then to the website. If Google had not been that middle piece, and let's just say they went somewhere else, like they went from YouTube to Google to maybe Facebook, then the website. Would that have been recorded? Like, yes. would that show up? Yeah, yeah. So let me go back there real quick because that's a that's a good question. So right in here, see that blue line? That shows all traffic. Uh, Once I saw that blue line pop up, I'm like, whoa, what? I know the green line didn't do it. What did it? Right. So I would actually go in and find it. Oh, it was it was Facebook. Got uh, it. Right. Okay. So, Great. But yeah, right. that's that's a great question. Thank you. All right, Taylor. I don't think we had any other questions then, correct? No, I did not see any other questions come through. But um, as you saw, you know, um, Chris shared his contact information, and so uh, you can go ahead and you know reach out to him if you have any questions. Right, and we will get the video to everybody, um, so you'll have this information again. Just want to mention, I'm not going to mention all four of the next upcoming events. You can see that. And again, that'll be included in the email that we send to you. But our very next event is Wednesday, June 24th. It's a lunchtime webinar, 11.30 to 12.30. Misty Cortez, uh, the founder of Your Marketing Coach, she will be talking about to bot or not. What is a chat bot? and how to use it to benefit your business. So please join us. That is up on the website now. You can register now. We do have limited seats, so get in there. So at the very least, you can get the recording. And again, Chris, thank you very much for your presentation. Again, it's always an eye opener to me and what I need to learn as a marketer. This was terrific information and I'm very anxious to get it out to everybody who attended and who registered. Well, so thank you for saying that. I'm happy to do it. Joining us. And maybe next time we'll get to see you soon in person yeah, live. Absolutely. And when you put up your uh, slide with the three Washington national pitchers, <laughs> I actually said to myself, because I did not watch the World Series because I was mad at the Houston Astros, I actually said, oh, those three pitchers pitched for the D-backs at one time. Yeah. So. Sad so but true. Are, yep. Yeah, sad but true. The ones true. that got away. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But thank you again, Chris, for joining us. And once again, we thank our sponsors. 
Uh, and Taylor, thank you again for managing this whole process for us. We really appreciate it. Anyone has video needs, please call Financial Potion and Taylor Wellman. And then we thank our supporters. And hopefully we will see you all again online in two weeks, a little less than two weeks on June 24th. Uh, website of uh, amaphoenix.org, please visit it and we will uh, keep you posted with upcoming events. Thank you for joining us everyone and have a great remainder of the day. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Bye.